really interested in our ingredient labels on things that we consume and put in our bodies. But how about the things that we put on our bodies? Who reads the ingredient labels? And if you do, do you know what they mean? Our guest today is going to explain that and break down an ingredient label on a product that is a skincare product. He is an author, a cosmetic chemist, and the list goes on and on. There are links to um, find him in the description box. Let me introduce you. There we go. Perry Romanowski, how are you? Hello. So nice to have uh, be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, we appreciate you being a guest on Happy Skin Over 50. And I do want to mention that all of our guests are not over the age of 50. But Well, I will, I will mention that I am over the age of 50, actually. I just yes. turned 53 yesterday. I know you had a birthday yesterday, didn't you? Thank Happy you. birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Jill Russell, and I'm the host of um, Happy Skin Over 50. We are going to just start right off, I think, with a little bit of an introduction about why we have to have this. There's also a link from the FD&A Act, which uh, is the, what, governing authority, Perry, over? Uh, it's it's really the FD&A. Uh, F uh, FDA, which is Food, Drug, and Cosmetics. Um, oh, oh, FDA and C Act. Yeah, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Yeah. Anyway, y'all, there's a link in the description. <laughs> yeah. They are the they are the regulatory body. The FDA is the regulatory body that has uh, uh, a purview over cosmetics, drugs, and food. The act was the agency was created back in 1938 in the United States, and since then they've governed uh, what goes on our bodies and in our bodies. So it's protecting us from ourselves, right? <laughs> well, that is the that's ideally that's what's going on. Yes. Well, the FDA interestingly was created because before there was an FDA, there were some products on the market that were actually causing causing harm to people making people blind, killing people, uh, you know, they have mercury in products and, and there were a lot of poisons. And so the FDA was created specifically to help prevent those sort of uh, damaging uh, effects of products on the market. You know, well, you brought up um, an idea or a subject, I guess we're, we're just going to call it. There's a difference in um, regulations from European standards and uh, United States standards and that sort of thing. One list is a lot longer than the other because with the U.S. standards, we we do not mention things that would be like lighter fluid, gasoline, turpentine, where in other country standards, it's mentioned and that's why they've got a longer list, right? Absolutely. You're talking about the list of ingredients that are banned from being used in cosmetics. Uh, yes. in, the FDA has about 11 or 12 really banned ingredients, whereas the EU regulations will have, you know, 1500 maybe at the, at the time. But there's some technical reasons why that is true, but a lot of those 1500 ingredients that are banned are not things that people are gonna use in cosmetics. I think the important thing to look at when you're looking at regulations uh, if you look at the products comparison between what's in the United States and what is sold in Europe, they're almost identical. There are not different ingredients really used between the two. Now, there's some um, some local differences because of fragrances and extracts and that kind of thing. But for the most part, products that you buy in Europe are going to be the same ingredients that are used in products in the United States. You mentioned fragrances, so can you touch on fragrances and uh, perfumed uh, products a little bit? Fragrance, fragrances do not have to be broken down, right? It just, on the label, it can say fragrances. Exactly, and a fragrance is often made up of, you know, 50 to 100 different kinds of chemicals. 
Um, and the reason for that is that uh, if you put uh, all of the ingredients that make up a fragrance on the back of a bottle, all that you're going to have is a big list of chemicals that's not going to be very helpful to anyone. Um, you have to understand the reason that companies were required or are now required to put ingredients on their labels. It's not for marketing reasons. It's there to tell people if you have an allergy to a certain uh, compound, then that it's there. And that's what, it's, that's what it's always supposed to have been for. Now it's been turned into uh, a marketing thing, and which has which uh, made it more uh, less useful for consumers, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. But as far as fragrances go, I will say that uh, it is the safety of fragrances is regulated by a group called the uh, IFTRA, the International Fragrance Trade Association. They list the levels, the safe levels of ingredients that can be used in fragrances. And so presumably if you're using a fragrance that has been gone through the IFRA standards, that is also going to be a safe fragrance to use. Does a company have to pass uh, that standard in order to put their uh, product on the market for either professional use, medical use, or for uh, the general consumer? In the United States, there is no pre-market requirement. Uh, the rules are that it's illegal to put an unsafe product on the market, and you have to be able to prove, if challenged, that your product is safe. In the United States, we're really good at suing people. So companies have a financial interest. At least big companies have a big financial interest to ensure the safety of their products. Uh, lots and, and small companies are under less pressure, which uh, is why I think the products are a little, uh, a, a little uh, more precarious to use for, from really small companies. But from big companies, you know, they have to... Uh, be able to demonstrate safety and their legal departments certainly wouldn't let them put something out on the market without having all the proper paperwork. One other thing I will add is that um, a lot of big companies that produce stuff in the United States, they also produce stuff in Europe and Europe requires an entire dossier of uh, listing all of the testing that you did. And so like a company like P&G, who's going to sell products in the United States, they're going to have all the same testing for the same product they're selling out in Europe. So as far as big companies go, they, they do all the safety testing that's required. Well, another question that is brought to mind, um, something you just mentioned, if we have something that is approved in the United States, we may not be able to ship it to other countries, to Europe, right? Uh, that's true, but it goes both ways, too. Uh, in the United States, for example, we are more strict uh, with sunscreens. We only have uh, a few uh, uh, approved sunscreen actives, and sunscreens are considered an over-the-counter drug here. In the EU, they have many more sunscreen actives, um, and it's just considered a cosmetic over there. And so it would be illegal to take something from the more theoretically more regulated EU as far as sunscreen go and bring it to the United States because those would would not be deemed uh, safe enough to be used uh, based on our regulations in the United States. So it does kind of go both ways. Some of our viewers may uh, be interested in knowing, you mentioned over the counter on the SPF, it's not considered a cosmetic or cosmeceutical necessarily, is it? It would be in the same realm as say a dandruff shampoo that Andrew shampoos, uh, antiperspirant, deodorants, uh, but uh, you know, like something like uh, aspirin too. I mean, these are over that. These are drugs. Uh, they have drug effects, and you can buy them without a prescription. And so that's that's the way they're classified in the United States. I'm a licensed esthetician, so it's kind of like, well, we're walking a thin line. Do we say uh, yes? You must use SPF when that is recognized as an over-the-counter thing. When I'm not going to say yes, you must take an aspirin or uh, yes, you must use dandruff shampoo. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and another anti-acne product are also considered over-the-counter drugs. So things that have drug effects that can affect your body are considered drugs in the United States. Um, and things and as things that are cosmetics are things that are only supposed to affect the appearance uh, of your body. And so that's really the where the definitions uh, sort of, it gets a little murky, of course, but that's the legal definitions there. Oh, thank you for clarifying that. That, yeah, you've cleared up the murkiness. 
you uh, we, we're going to talk about several things but over one percent has to be listed in the order uh right yeah but that, is, of, that is what we call the one percent rule so as as far as concentration goes the ingredients are listed in order of concentration to the level of one percent but below one percent actually one percent and below companies are allowed to put the ingredients in any order that they like and okay. and so what marketers do they want to be clever because uh they want people to think they they believe that people think that it's all listed in order okay and that's that's a common myth out there. Uh, they don't really people don't really know about the one percent line. And so what marketers will do if they put in a vitamin, for example, say they put in a, a vitamin A in your formula or, or vitamin B or what some vitamin, uh, they don't want that vitamin to be listed in the level that it actually is, which would be like what it, at the bottom. They want to list it higher up, so they'll find they'll list it as high as they can, just below the one percent line, so people think that there's more in there. Oh, I see. Okay. It's just a little marketing trick in the industry. So it's not necessarily like, like a lot of us have been led to believe that it's in the order. Of course, of course we understand that these are all proprietary formulas and we can't just take the ingredients here and go, Oh, I'm going to make this myself and get the ingredients. If, if we can, well, I mean, you, you could try to do that, but just because you have all of the, uh, if you know the list of ingredients that go into making a cake, doesn't mean you're going to be able to make that cake. So true. I'm going to mention, uh, also, I want, do want to mention right now that um, Perry has, uh, there are links in the description yep. of this, but he's got many different programs that are available to um, well, they would be available to the general consumer, I guess. Yeah. Right, Perry? I have, but a website, uh, I have a website where I teach people how to make cosmetics or be cosmetic chemists, a place called chemistcorner.com, and you can find more information there. I also uh, host a, a mostly weekly, weekly podcast called The Beauty Brains, where we answer consumer questions. <laughs> about and that, that one is a fun, well, both of them to me are fun, but that's that's how I found you uh, with an invitation several years ago to uh, Chemist Corner. And I've tried to attend as many uh, of your webinars as I can. Not that I want to be a cosmetic chemist, but uh, just for my interest. And of course, this is my my career and my vocation. On, Let's get to the list. Sure, sure. Some of the uh, last things that were mentioned, well... Okay, I'm going to start with the first, which is aqua slash water. Yeah. Rarely do we ever see water listed. It's usually aqua and then sometimes aqua slash water. Okay, the, the reason for something like that, it's, it's, it's really the main reason is this. This company wants to sell their products in, say, the United States, but they also might want to sell it in Canada. And in Canada, you need to use, uh, you might need to use French and English. And okay. so, uh, or they might want to sell this in a place in Europe where they want you to use the word aqua. So um, the reason you see aqua and water together is just so they only need to use one label rather than multiple labels for different countries. Okay, so that would be the first one. One of the last things that's mentioned and it's promoted as having this ingredient is um, aloe leaf juice. Yeah. And that's one of the last things mentioned, but it's promoted as being, oh, this is an aloe formula. Well, uh, so this is how. Uh, this, this does is that how mean aloe vera? Well, yeah, that's the idea there is, yeah, the aloe barbadensis leaf juice is an ingredient that's, you know, it's the juice derived from an aloe plant. Now, I will mention here that it's not people going out, getting an aloe plant and squeezing it out the juice and getting that juice. What it really is, is it's people going and getting an aloe plant, squeezing that juice, and then diluting that uh, with, uh, you know, 99% water. And so you have a, it's more of a 1% solution that's then diluting that uh, with, uh, you know, 99% Okay, water. sorry, I've got... So you have a, it's more of a we're going two places here and I had the audio on, on that. Okay. So shall we start with the 
the, the breakdown of it and explain a little bit as you go. If there's something that needs to be skipped, of course, you know, let's just go ahead and, and, and skip it. Sure. Well, just to let people know, this is a, this is a, a hand salve, essentially a hand moisturizer product. Um, one of the first things that you should know about these types of products is that they're mostly water. So that's why water is the first ingredient there. And when I say mostly water, it's likely that it's anywhere from uh, 75 to 85 percent water. OK, so that's a lot of water. <laughs> uh, the next ingredients in this are what we call uh, em emollients. These are oily materials. And these are the ones when you put it on your skin, they're going to feel slippery. They're going to look shiny. And they're going to make your skin that might have been dry uh, feel more uh, more flexible and pliable. And so that's why these ingredients are in there. And that's the ingredient, the uh, caprylic, capric, myristic, steric triglycerides. You see the word triglyceride there. You know triglycerides are fats just from the food, you know. And, and fats and oils, are those are slippery materials. I did miss a, an ingredient here. Uh, before that is the ingredient glycerin, and glycerin is what we call a humectant. Uh, humectant is an, a, a material that is able to absorb water from the atmosphere. And it's just because of the molecular structure of glycerin that that happens. And so if you put glycerin on a dry, dry hand surface, it's going to pull in moisture from uh, the atmosphere or maybe pull some moisture in from the lower layers of your skin and it'll hold on to that moisture. And so if there's uh, glycerin in your outer layers of the skin, it's going to hold on to the moisture into that part of the skin. Can we talk about glycerin for a minute? Let's break down glycerin. There are several types of glycerin, right? Is there a vegan type? Is there is some of it vegetable? Is it uh, animal? Well, as far as as far as things go, um, glycerin uh, from a chemistry standpoint, all the glycerins are glycerin. Uh, it's a uh, it's, it's got three carbons and three oxygen uh, or, or OH groups on it, and that's glycerin. Now, glycerin, when people talk about vegan glycerin, uh, what they're talking about is the source of the glycerin. Glycerin right. is something that actually is created as a byproduct of the soap making process. Soap is uses what's called a triglyceride. So that's three carbons with these fatty groups attached to it. And when it turns into soap, those fatty groups get taken off. And what's left is that little three carbon thing called glycerin. Now, if you start with your fatty acids that come from, say, coconut oil, um, the glycerin you get from that would be considered a vegan glycerin. However, soap used to be made pretty extensively from the byproducts of the meat industry and from an ingredient called tallow. Tallow is animal fat. And if you're making a tallow soap, the glycerin that comes off of that wouldn't be considered uh, uh, vegan because it came from an animal derived ingredient. And so that's the difference there. But as, as far as the chemistry goes and the effect goes, the glycerin is exactly the same whether it came from tallow or whether it came from vegan, it's the same ingredient. Okay. All right, next we have uh, butylene glycol. And butylene glycol is also another humectant, just like glycerin. The difference here is that glycerin can be a little more sticky. Glycerin, though, is the, of all of the humectants available to formulators, glycerin is actually the most effective for the price that you use. So, and, and for the amount that you use. So there might be an ingredient that binds moisture better, say something like a hyaluronic acid. It binds moisture better than, uh, than glycerin, but uh, on a molecule for molecule basis, you put in some glycerin, it's going to work uh, from a moisturization standpoint better than even a hyaluronic acid. It's just not a sexy ingredient and it doesn't really do well at selling products as something like a hyaluronic acid. Butylene glycol here is also a humectant, so um, it's added, mo it's, but it's also added to be a, a solvent for some of the other ingredients that are in here. When we, uh, you mentioned hyaluronic acid, uh, acid is after a lot of terms, but we're not, that's not what I'm wanting to touch on. Hyaluronic acid, it's being promoted as it can absorb or retain 1,000 times its weight in water. 
or fluid. Yeah. Right. But that does not mean if somebody puts anything on their skin that it, and it has the hyaluronic acid that it's going to get a thousand times of the water, either yeah. drawing it from the body or the atmosphere. No, right. Not at all. And so what, what that claim is a thousand times it's weight in water uh, it, or it's, they're talking about the molecular weight of the molecule. And so it's, it, it you're not going to notice like, a, if you had a, a, say you had a little jar full of hyaluronic acid and you left it open and to, so it could start absorbing water from the air, you're not going to notice a, a weight difference, right? It's not going to absorb enough water that you would notice any weight difference. But when they're talking about that claim, what they're talking about is, uh, on a molecular level, if you take the molecular weight of the hyaluronic acid, uh, the number of water molecules that will attach to it is about a thousand times what the molecular weight of that is. It, but from a consumer standpoint, the number seems very impressive, but it's, it doesn't really mean anything uh, when it goes to a macro level. When you go on, on a, a level that people can know a difference, it doesn't mean anything. But on a marketing level, when you talk about the molecules, well, a thousand times can sound very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> well, it looks like the next ingredients we have here uh, is the hydrogenated olive oil. Um, and then also you have the uh, sterile esters and the uh, uh, buteros spearmint aparki butter or the shea butter. So uh, now what we have here is a part of uh, part of lotions that is the more emollient. So these, these things are doing the same kinds of things as the uh, capric uh, triglycerides. But I will say that the shea butter actually has the added effect of doing a, a, a process called occlusion. So it can make a film on the surface of the skin and it can block. Now, uh, uh, let me step back here. What happens to cause your skin to feel dry is that water from inside your body gets into the skin and then it leaves the skin when because the atmosphere around you is dry and that's why in the winter time when the air is drier there's a motion from the water in your body to leave your body now when it's very humid you know people in florida they don't usually worry about uh you know dry skin because it's all humid there and so when it's humid out there's not as much a tendency of the water to go out into the atmosphere. When it's dry, it goes out more. Now, what we do with an occlusive ingredients like shea butter or petrolatum or mineral oil, those kinds of ingredients, they will put a, 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 a film on the surface of the skin and that will prevent water uh, it will prevent water from leaving the skin as rapidly as if you didn't have it there. I do want to say, and I've often seen this claim that's that putting uh, petrolatum or occlusive agents on your skin is like wrapping your skin in saran wrap. And it's not like that. It's not that uh, it's not a film like that. It's not as impermeable as it seems. Skin water still does get through when you have petrolatum on your skin, just not as much as uh, it normally would. Well, we're on shea butter. We're I'm kind of going to deviate a little bit and kind of sure. break down more. And I'm not sure if it's in one of your courses or uh, webinars that I heard this. I'm going to say learned it, but it's like, mm, I guess it's fact <laughs> that in European countries, if a product contains shea butter, it cannot attain more than 28% shea butter. Does that ring a bell with you or uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with that kind of regulation. I, I, I from a formulating standpoint, uh, I, you could make a product that contains more than that. So there's no formulation issue. So there might be some type of regulatory issue there, but I'm just not aware of that. So in the U S there's not, there is not any regulation. Okay. Like that. okay. What do we have next? Uh, we got, uh, there, there is a thickener in here, the aluminum starch, uh, octanol succinate. Uh, that is, uh, an ingredient added there. You don't, you, when you're making a, a lotion or a cream, you don't want it to be water thin because it'll just <laughs> fall spread out all over your skin. So you need to add thickeners. That's what that ingredient, that starch thickener is doing in there. Uh, that is not the only thickener in there. Uh, ingredients like C-tyrol alcohol, uh, the PEG 75 glycerol stearate, 
those have a thickening effect. They also have uh, an effect of emulsification. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has to be included in uh, products like this, when you have a water and an oil, uh, normally they don't mix. If you think of salad dressing, uh, where you have to shake it up, a vinaigrette or something, and they're, they're separated. Well, that's because there's there we have to to get those things to come together and stay together. We have to include ingredients called emulsifiers, and that's what these uh, ingredients like the PEG seventy five stearate or the glycerol stearate those are considered emulsifiers. They are compatible with both the water and they're compatible with the oil, and so it helps bring them together and helps keep them together. And so you get a uh, an, an unseparated product, and that's why those are in there. So it helps it to bind. Sometimes uh, when consumers will see the word or it looks like aluminum or something, they think, well, there's uh, aluminum in it, but this is not like an aluminum that's in a, an aluminum can sure. or something. It's, it's not, it's not it the kind that's stick it, together. It, right. The, there's, there's no uh, safety issues uh, uh, that you'd be concerned about from this aluminum starch uh, in the same way, like uh, drinking from an aluminum can uh, for juice or a soda or something like that. Those are safe to do too. That's the same sort of safety here. Okay. Uh, next up in this, we have uh, these mostly emulsifiers. Now we have some sesame uh, indicium oil or sesame seed oil. Uh, now, this is what this is what I want to point out to people. This is a this formula has a lot of ingredients. OK, um, but as far as ingredients that you're going to notice, um, I've already talked about all the ingredients from a performance standpoint that you're going to notice. OK, you're going to notice the effect of glycerin. You're going to know the effect of water. You'll notice the effect of the triglycerides and the shea butter. Whether you're going to notice the sesame seed oil, uh, I'm going to say you will not notice that because all of those ingredients, there's more of them, and they just sort of will over flood the, the any no, anything that you might notice about these ingredients that come afterwards. And the reason that these ingredients are added are specifically so this brand has something to talk about. Because uh, nobody says, hey, use our shea butter product. I mean, some people will say use our shea butter product, but everybody can say that, right? Yes. But they want to say this has a special sesame oil in it and it does have it in there, but it's just not going to have much effect on uh, how the product works. It's just there for strictly for marketing. Also, the ingredients like the avocado oil, uh, the cratizima oil and unsurprisingly or maybe surprisingly for you, the aloe vera leaf juice. That's just in this formula, even though they call it out as though this is an aloe formula. It's not in there to have any kind of noticeable effect. Aloe, if if aloe was in there by itself, you might notice a humectant effect. You might notice a, a sort of a smoothing effect. But when it's in there with glycerin, when it's in there with butylene glycol, when it's in there with the shea butter, it's just not. It's not going to be noticed. So this is not. I mean, we can't just take. Um, okay, so the sesame seed oil, tahini. Tahini, yeah, uh, uh, avocado, guacamole, and a, an aloe vera leaf, and mix it together and rub it on our skin, and think that we're just going to be absolutely have the softest skin and be gorgeous, right? Right. Uh, that you that that will not work. In fact, if you took this formula and you took all of those ingredients out, this formula would still work the same. Be the same. <laughs> So there is one other uh, ingredient here that I didn't mention that is listed, and it's listed low, but uh, it's the dimethicone. Dimethicone is a silicone, and the silicone will definitely have an impact on uh, the formula. Uh, it works in a different way than hydrocarbons, and so you can you can just it just has a noticeable feel that you know most people will be able to to see. But uh, as far as different oils, you don't you're not really able to tell differences there. When you're talking about uh, most people will be able to see, do you mean see as in they can see the the shininess uh, of it, or they can feel they can see that there's a difference yeah. in before and after. I I would say both things. So you there okay. is a visual difference with dimethicone. Definitely a visual difference. It's it's more shiny. Your product is going to be more shiny when there's a silicone included. 
But also, I also meant see in a feel kind of way. You can put something on and then you feel the difference. So there's both the sight and a feel difference that you'll notice with dimethicone in there. Okay. How much water is too much in a product? Is there such a thing as too much water? Well, uh, if there's so much water in there that it causes separation or that it doesn't work, uh, then there's too much. But, you know, companies will add uh, enough water that makes the product work, uh, but not more than that. So. Okay. And then can you answer this question, this burning question for me? How can O2, how can oxygen be added to an ingredient product? Well, uh, the, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. If you just mean gaseous oxygen, uh, what you can do is you take a liquid and you take uh, an air hose and you put it in there and you bubble it up. If you, if you think of like a fish tank, right? Fish tanks have those bubblers and those bubblers are actually adding oxygen to the water. So that's how, that's how it would work. There are products that are like oxygen boosters. Yeah. Or oxygen cleaner. What, where, where does the oxygen come from? Do we take it and we, we separate it and then it goes into, the, it's not in this, but it's in, in other products. And that seems to be in the past year, uh, th there are trends that are kind of catchphrases that we've sure. been using all along. Right. But that one seemed to be the highlight. It's oxygen, oxygen enhanced, oxygen boosted. Yeah. That's just uh, just a marketing story. There's nothing different about the products. And it's just one of those stories that you can claim. You know, if you if you bubble something in there, hey, you put oxygen in. So if somebody sues you and says, oh, did you put oxygen in there? You say, hey, yeah, here's how we put oxygen in there. Now, this isn't going to make a whit of difference in how the product works, uh, but it does give the marketing people something to talk about, something new to talk about. You know, this is one of the challenges of the cosmetic industry. The technology hasn't been changing very much. It's not like you know cell phones they change all the time right oh they get faster they can store more uh shampoos skin lotions these things don't change that much and so it's uh you can if you're a marketer you want to give people a reason to buy your product and so the only reason you can't when you can't differentiate your product based on technology the only way you can do it is based on a story and that's really what is passes as innovation in the cosmetic industry Whoever has the better story is going to sell more products. So it's product de jour then, I guess. <laughs> yes. Can you, um, would you please, I know you can, explain the difference in vitamin C and ester C. That seems to be a big question, an age-old question all, all along. Sure. Well, vitamin C, ascorbic acid, um, by itself, it left, left to its own accord into the atmosphere, it's going to react. It's an antioxidant. And in the air is a lot of oxygen. Actually, 20% of the air is oxygen. And so if your ascorbic acid is exposed to air, it's going to react with that and it's going to break down and then become uh, less effective or non-effective as, as things go. So one of the challenges of formulating is if you formulate uh, a vitamin C into your product, well, your products are not airtight and they're, they're exposed to, to light. And so after you've made your lotion, you know, a week later, all of the vitamin C that was in there has already broken down. And by the time it gets to the consumer's uh, shelf, they buy it, uh, all of the vitamin C, while they put it in there originally, it's all kind of gone, it's all oxidized. So, so one of the ways that, that companies have tried to stabilize this, I mean, to stop this reaction, is they chemically react the ascorbic acid. And so they'll try something like uh, on, making an aldehyde, ascorbic acid aldehyde. And the aldehyde does not uh, react the same way with the oxygen. And so in that way, it's more stable. In that way, also, it's a less effective antioxidant, which is why you don't really see as, uh, as good uh, effects using uh, derivatives of vitamin C rather than just the vitamin C itself. So that is the, that's a formulation challenge, uh, and that's why those are in there. Okay, you use the word uh, aldehyde. Can you break yeah. that down or define it for us, please? Uh, so it, in mm -hmm. organic chemistry, um, 
there are e, e, there's there's classification of different molecules um and uh and when you're talking about uh esters for example um what you have is a carbon um a carbon chain um reacted with a uh, an oxygen right and mm -hmm. and so you have a, a carbon an oxygen and carbon if you look at the molecule well when yes. you look at a an aldehyde uh you have the carbon chain length and then you have an oxygen and uh, which is a double bonded oxygen and then you have another carbon chain length so uh, aldehyde is just a functional group the way the, the molecule is structured uh and now, if you know, I, I show you pictures of this, but it doesn't really mean a lot to you. Just think yeah. you have a fatty, a, a carbon chain one way, a carbon chain another way, and in between there is a, a carbon attached to an oxygen, and that is considered an aldehyde group. Okay, so we're talking an alcohol group is that same one, but instead of a, a carbon bonded to an oxygen, it's a carbon bonded to an oxygen and a hydrogen together, and so that would be considered an alcohol. So. Yeah. Okay. But I Good. encourage anyone who's really interested, go take some organic chemistry and you can get them all. Was, excuse me. I was going to make a disclaimer here. Now, uh, this show does not make one a, a cosmetic chemist <laughs> or a chemist of, of any sort. Yeah. And I'm certainly a long way from that. Would you tell us again that you've, you've got the show and everything is in the, the links. Um, You've got the podcast. It's a about weekly, and then yeah. you also offer these courses for people who are interested in knowing more about cosmetic chemistry, but then also who are interested in being formulators or 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 have a degree in chemistry or or pursuing a degree in chemistry. So, can you just tell us because there are yeah. a lot of links in our description right. to find sure. you, please? We have a, so I have a, a website called Chemist Corner. And we have a variety of, of uh, courses. We have a course in our, our main course is practical cosmetic formulating. And this was a course that I had put together based on a live course that I do. Um, I, I work with the Society of Cosmetic Chemists and I teach a continuing education course to people that are new to the industry. So if there's a salesperson coming in or a person right out of college or just somebody interested in uh, formulating, uh, the practical cosmetic formulation course uh, is is on a level where you don't actually need a scientific background. You just have to have an interest in cosmetics and ingredients. And I, I teach the course as such that you, you don't need a science background to understand it. It helps if you have that, but it's not required. So we have that. We have another course on just raw materials. Uh, again, it's targeted for people new to the industry. Uh, but it gets uh, much more in depth. Uh, so if you're looking at formulating, the practical cosmetic formulating course is uh, was worthwhile. If you're more interested in the ingredients, I would give, say the raw material course. We also have a course uh, that's sort of geared toward natural formulating. And so it's if you take uh, standard formulas, how might you spin those and make them natural formulas? Uh, and so those are our main courses that we have. And then you've got your podcast. It's Beauty Brains, right? The Beauty Brains podcast, yeah. And uh, that's real scientists answering beauty questions. I have a, a partner who I work with. She's uh, also a cosmetic formulator. And the thing about this uh, podcast is we don't take any advertising. And so uh, we're able, in that way, we're able to uh, just tell people what we really think about products and the way they're marketed and whether they work. And it's, it's extremely interesting, too, because... Sometimes there are headlines on uh, ingredients and products, and then sometimes there are little little blurbs here and there that are kind of hidden on products. But you and her name's Valerie, right? Yeah, Valerie. Yeah, yeah. my partner. You and Va Valerie pick up on those and um, explain it. I'm not going to say pick it apart. Oh, I just. <laughs> say it. Well, I think the thing is that a lot of times uh, marketers rely on people to create the story in their own mind. And it, they hope that they don't really read the exact claim that is there. Because if you do read specifically the words that are there, it might mean something different than what you thought it meant when you first read it. <laughs> one, yeah. of the, one of the tricks that uh, copywriters will do in the marketing of cosmetics is they'll say, uh, this formula with aloe 
uh, has this great effect. Well, the formula, if you read that sentence, really the formula has a great effect. The aloe is, oh, it just happens to be in there. It's, but the takeaway from the consumer is, oh, it's the aloe that's making it work when it's, we all know it's not really, at least the marketers know it's not really. It would be the same as saying this product with sand, with this, this product with cotton, this, you know, exactly. yeah, it's the exactly. width. Right. And, you know, so what, y'all? <laughs> well, you should always be skeptical of marketing claims. That's all I, <laughs> that's all I want you to know. <laughs> yes. And that is uh, one of the reasons you were top on my list to have you on my show. Happy skin after f over 50 after uh, we launched. Well, actually, you were on my list before I launched. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I appreciate you being here. I thank you so much. Do you have any uh, parting words before I um, ask you the, the question du jour? Uh, no, uh, what I do want to uh, help people understand is that probably one of the biggest myths that people believe is that if a product is more expensive, it's going to work better. Uh, and that's absolutely not true when it comes to beauty products. Uh, uh, more expensive products does not necessarily mean it's going to work better, especially in skincare. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Okay. The question, what, what we usually close with on uh, happy skin over 50 is what was your inspiration? What was your inspiring moment? What was the person that um, person, place or thing idea that has gotten you to, where you are today and to being a cosmetic chemist and also an educator? Well, um, actually, when I was in high school, uh, I took a, uh, a speech class and getting up in front of that speech class and being encouraged by that teacher to get up and speak. That's really where I discovered that I like doing it. And I sort of kept doing that. And as far as becoming a scientist, um, you know, I, I always liked animals, and so I started off as in biology. Uh, I needed a job, so I switched over to chemistry. Um, but I, my whole philosophy about science sort of has struck me from some of my instructors uh, in college and, and also uh, reading up on, on famous scientists. Uh, I'm very inspired by uh, Richard Feynman, the, the famous physicist, and the way that he approaches both learning and skeptically looking at things. And, and these are the, you know, these are, have been had significant impact on what I am doing now and, and why I do it the way I do it. And that, that is something, and, and his information is something that's literally timeless, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Even though you some of the read stuff, it and study it today and it's still yeah. applicable. Absolutely. And some of the stuff that he's talked about in the 1960s, uh, we've learned a lot more since then, and it's, it's uh, the, the specific details are not accurate any longer. But the approach to learning, the questioning, and always uh, looking, always being curious—that uh, has—that is a timeless, uh, uh, timeless characteristic that uh, people can adopt for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Perry Romanowski has been our guest today on Happy Skin Over 50. Perry, I thank you so much for this information. It's, it's been fun. It's been interesting for me. And I know that uh, consumers will find it uh, of interest as well as professionals and uh, possibly uh, future chemists. So <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Jill, for having me. It was very nice to be on the show. We are going to say goodbye now. If you have questions, you can put them in the comments and we'll make sure that Perry gets them.